Okay, well, let's get started. Everyone, it's, I'm sure we're going to have, have more people joining on as the evening progresses, and a lot of people are going to watch this in tape. But um, we have, we're switching gears tonight, and we have Andrew Tice here from House Spirits Distillery. Now, I know some people went on the distillery tour last weekend, and, uh, but for those of you who don't know anything about distilling, we're going to actually be covering that tonight. And Andrew has kindly decided to come and join <laughs> us to be our expert, which is great. So um, I will click the slides for him. Um, but if you want to tell me when to switch to, you want me to switch to the uh, process right away? Well, and you can sure. Start. Okay, so we'll have Andrew tell us a little bit about himself and his role at the uh, House Spirits, mm -hmm. and then um, how the process works. And then, of course, we always will have the opportunity for people to ask questions. Yeah. So let's take it away. Howdy. So my name is Andrew. I am the head distiller at House Spirits here in Portland. Um, and so um, just a little bit about me out of the craft brewing world originally. So I worked at Trogues. Uh, it's a regional craft brewer in Pennsylvania. Uh, when I moved out here, I started working for House Spirits. Um, almost two years ago. Um, I found many of the things to be very similar between craft brewing and craft distilling uh, in terms of the you know equipment. Uh, kind of your typical day is very similar in a lot of ways. Uh, and a lot of your, your same processes and you know same materials at least to begin with and then uh, and distilling. Oh, very good. <laughs> I like the drugs too. Uh, um, so a lot of the processes kind of they take off from brewing, or a lot of them are very similar. Uh, since the beginning of any kind of distilled spirit is going to be through a fermentation, uh, as you see through this little this little diagram here is, is pretty good as far as uh, describing a typical uh, what all kind of distilled spirits go through at some point in the process. Um, so the production part, of course, obviously through mashing and fermentation, is going to look a lot like like brewing. Um, at House Spirits, we do two different types of, of spirits, essentially. Uh, we do a clear set of spirits, uh, like gin, aquavit, and vodka. And then we also do uh, a straight malt whiskey, um, which is going to look a lot like this uh, distilled uh, diagram that you see there. So with our distilled whiskey, uh, essentially, you're going to start just as you will with beer. Um, you're starting with a mash of malted barley, in our case, um, which is then fermented. We use an ale yeast. Uh, and you'd see a lot of larger bourbon producers are using corn with a bit of, of barley and probably some rye involved with that as well. And they're doing a fermentation. It's going to look very different than a typical beer fermentation. Uh, but for us uh, on the craft scale, uh, what we found is, is in partnering with the brewery, is that we're doing something that looks a lot like this. It looks a lot like uh, a typical beer brewing uh, through the fermentation stage and, of course, the, the distillation, uh, aging, and bottling. So. Essentially, what we do with our whiskey is that we're making an 8% or so beer uh, and then twice distilling that through a pot distilling process to uh, create a pot distilled 100% uh, straight malt whiskey, uh, which we age for two years in barrels uh, and then is bottled at the appropriate proof. Um, it's a pretty uh, direct synopsis of how, of how we do that with, with the whiskey. Uh, the gin is, is a different, different kind of process involving different feedstocks. So I, I don't know what we have for that, if we have a diagram for that, but that's that's a lot different of a process. But essentially, uh, if you were to make something like whiskey, this is uh, very close to the process that you would you would follow to, to make well, we that. Don't, we don't have a different diagram. So okay. do you want to just say like what would be different if you were making, you make vodka and gin. We make vodka, gin, and, and aquavit. It's a Scandinavian style um, spirit. It's flavored with caraway and star anise. Uh, so just like jun uh, juniper must be featured in all gins as one of the primary flavor components, um, we use caraway uh, and star anise for, for the aquavit. But essentially, you're cutting out a lot of the steps in making something like a gin or an aquavit. Uh, most craft producers, and indeed most producers, and all producers in Britain to make something like a gin, they're going to start uh, with 190 proof ethanol that they'll bring in. And so at that point, we'll bring that in and we'll perform a maceration or a vapor extraction when we're doing the distillation. So we're bringing in uh, a set quantity of, of alcohol. And for our process, we'll take the spices that we use for our gin, juniper, cardamom, coriander, lavender, orange peels, 
uh, and start an aniseed, and we'll we'll steep them in the spirit to pull out the flavors and colors, and then we'll perform that distillation. So you're skipping a lot of those those first kind of three steps. There is is kind of how I think about it. So you're creating like a spice tea uh, to then distill, and so so many folks are more um, person about the distilling, some not. Uh, essentially, what we're doing with the dis distillation is we're we're concentrating and extracting the most volatile and flavorful uh, components of that spice tea that we've made um, by boiling them. So obviously, ethanol has a lower boiling point than than water does, and so it's going to come off first, and it's going to bring a lot of the flavor molecules along with it. Uh, it's going to travel up through, as you see, um, that can de that um, kind of long neck of the of the still and into that part on the right there, which is the condenser, which is cooled by some means. Uh, on our scale, we use a, we're using cold city water to cool it down, uh, and it's going to collect into a, a high-proof distillate um, that we collect and, and then store and then uh, end up cutting down to bottling proof and bottling. So Tom wants to know, do you buy your 150-proof stuff from the rectifier in Oregon? Uh, no, our current source is we um, we use a company called Ultra Pure, so there are a number of uh, neutral grain spirit sources. So that's that's kind of the terminology that people use, neutral grain spirit. So um, just in making, just as in making uh, whiskey, as you'd have that mashing and fermentation and then distillation part, uh, you have large scale rectifiers like your big ethanol plants across the country. Uh, some doing a lot of biofuels and ethanols and things like that, and then some doing uh, beverage alcohol as well. And that's that's what we're buying. Uh, so they're doing that fermentation usually almost exclusively with corn and then distilling that into a beverage alcohol at a very, very high proof, uh, usually through a, almost yeah, exclusively through a column still. So just like you'd see in like a big ethanol refinery or uh, like an oil, uh, oil plant, they're, uh, they're separate, separating it out to a very, very high degree. So that's how you have ext extremely high proof. Um, it's allowing for great separation of the distilled spirits. So you're separating all the ethanol from all the other components and you're ending up with a very, very pure product, 95%, uh, which is 190 proof, which is extremely, extremely pure uh, without going to extraordinary chemical kind of means to uh, create a higher proof product that basically as soon as you expose it to air will revert to a lower proof um, by absorbing air and water. Um, so most, so you can think of, you know, all those steps having had to happen for each um, each distilled spirit you know drop that you've ever you know, consumed or encountered in your life. So there there are a number of rectifiers. There are, are some folks in Oregon, but we have not done business with them. Uh, they, that's that's very kind of broad uh, look at the process. But I'm I'm kind of loose uh, skipped over a number of very small steps. Uh, so this is our this is our flagship product, uh, Aviation American Gin. Um, and you see in front of it all the, the spices that go into each batch of gin, um, and that kind of makes our unique flavor profile. Uh, so as, a, as I was saying, uh, you know, gin must be flavored with juniper, and those are the little uh, dark blueberries kind of in the background there. And then it's kind of up to the distiller to create their own flavor profile, just as you would with different uh, malts and hops to create your, and yeasts to create your signature flavor for, uh, for beer. Uh, that's essentially what we do with gin. So um, if you've not had our gin, um, describe it. We call it an American style dry gin. So it's a bit of a different take of on gin than you would find, uh, say, if you're used to your beef eaters, tangerays, uh, Bombay sapphires, which are the classic London dry gins. Um, you know, our spice profile, I would say, is, is a lot different uh, and features less of the heavy hand on the juniper, so more of a kind of integrated uh, balance of flavors as opposed to like a really juniper-driven gin that most people are, are more familiar with. And that's kind of what defines our, our style of gin. You know, there's plenty of gins out there that very strongly juniper, so it, it seemed uh, kind of incumbent on us to do something different, to uh, stake out a different kind of space there, and, and to make a gin that was that worked differently in cocktails. And uh, we're a company with a very strong kind of cocktail focus, as our, our gin was um, partly developed by a, a local bartender. Uh, along with our distillers uh, back in 2005. So it, it has more of a cocktail spin than a lot of the classic gins, which are you know, you're better like in, say, like a martini or a gin and tonic. And they're kind of meant for that purpose. But 
Oh, yeah. so the, of all the product line, let's see yeah. where you have the line up here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's. That's just, that's just, that's just me looking into still uh, one day. Yeah. Well, let me just ask about the product line. Um, yes. This was your first product. <laughs> Uh, this was one of the first products, I believe. So the the company dates back to 2004. Or so when it was we were founded in Corvallis, uh, we came up to Portland in 2005, and one of the first products was a vodka. So one of the original partners uh, in the company uh, they created Medoya vodka, uh, and you see that's pretty class typical or classic with a lot of um, small scale distilleries um, that work more as rectifiers at first. Um, as vodka, you know, according to the federal code of regulations. It, it's supposed to be a neutral, completely flavorless uh, ethanol in America. Um, and most of that is going to come from corn. Most of the of the vodkas that you drink that, that come from America, you know, your Tito's and really, really a huge number of brands, uh, they're going to be a corn-based distillate that they do various number of steps to. Some may redistill, um, although it's not typically common. And more, more often it's just a filtration through charcoal to remove some of the impurities that that make the vodka less pleasing. So um, I think the original product was a vodka, but then shortly after they came up with aviation gin. So they started working on different batches, and I think it took about 30 batches or so when they were at the, the kind of correct uh, blend for the flavor that they were they were looking to get to. So that, that's kind of one of our claims to fame, is that we're first distiller kind of bartender partnership, um, which has really influenced and kind of driven the, the direction of the company. Um, as far as a lot of the marketing that we do and, and a lot of the outreach that we try and position ourselves as, as a product. Now we'll go yeah. back to your slide yeah. of you peering in. Yeah, so that's me watching one of our whiskers uh, boil away one day. So that's me uh, looking at one of our stills. We have two stills. One is dedicated mostly to whiskey uh, and occasionally, occasionally rum, and the other that we we process uh, our gin and aquavit through. So that's um, nice to have two stills to allow us to do a lot of products like that without cleaning between every single uh, distillation. Uh, this is uh, my assistant, Miles. Um, he's looking at a sample of gin. I'm guessing that is uh, what he's looking at is the luching of the oils at the beginning of the distillation. Um, so if you're familiar with um, different parts of distillation, there's the the heads, the hearts, and the tails. And so what he's looking at right now is that the very end of the heads cut of the gin, um, different oils and um, things in, in the components that we use as, as spices in the in the gin have different solubilities. So at this point, there's a lot of orange oils, I believe, that are coming off uh, at the very end of the hearts, or the heads, rather. And so we're doing a little leaching test where we'll add a little bit of water, and that causes the oils to precipitate out of the alcohol. Uh, into the water and, and to cause that clouding effect. And we don't like that clouding effect, so uh, we'll discard a good bit of, of the heads before we get to the hearts so that we don't have a, a cloudy gin that's uh, kind of unpleasant for the, the customer to see. So it's, it, if you're familiar with uh, distillation, you hear things about people going blind and you know, don't drink the heads and things like that. Um, we do that, but you know, there's really not a lot of danger with that. With the gin, it's just more of a flavor and a um, visual component for this. Um, since we're starting with 190 proof uh, spirit, which is quite pure, uh, very low in methanol and other impurities, uh, especially flavor active ones, uh, generally what we're most concerned about here is just the, the composition of the oils and uh, the quantity of them in there. So he's just taking a look at that cloudy gin, and it's not time to collect yet. Uh, here you're having a look at our bottling um, over the facility. So we have a very small six head. Um, bottler that's, you know, a lot of the things that we do are on a very small scale, so we're, it's a lot of hand, uh, hand-loved products or hand bottling and hand labeling a lot of things. Uh, this is just this filling, so it's a precise, uh, this is actually from, intended for use in the wine industry, I believe, um, but it fills to a very precise level, which is required by the federal government. Uh, in spirits, uh, there's a lot of very precise uh, measurements that you must take in regards to quantity and the strength of all your spirits, as that is what they are taxed on from a federal excise tax basis. Um, so coming from brewing, uh, there's a lot of differences between brewing and spirits. But um, you know, this level of precision that they're interested in is uh, is, is quite intense. So uh, coming from brewing, where you're, you're guessing things, or I, you know, I think it's about five 
0.3% or so, and you could be off by you know, a percent or two, uh, depending on how your fermentation proceeds, uh, having to be within. Uh, so as, as it states on our bottles for gin, uh, we're at 84 proof or 42% alcohol, and basically the tolerance is between 47.85% or 41.85% and just over 42. So it's very strict, uh, the tolerances uh, that they allow. So it uh, makes it very important. So what is the brand of the bottling? Uh, that looks like you're looking at aviation. I think it's aviation. I mean the um, equipment, because people have been interested in pricing equipment. Uh, you know, I don't know. I would say, you, I don't remember the exact one, um, but for like the spirits equipment, this is a, a relatively simple design, but I, you know, if you, if you wanted to know, call. I would say to call a, a um, winery supplies manufacturer. We have plenty of them, kind of McMinnville and Portland area. Um, and you could probably get a quote pretty easily for it's a pretty typical six head filler that um, this is all gravity fed so we have a pump filling a reservoir above there and then uh, a plunger style filler where you're activating the, the filling by putting the bottle into place and drives that plunger until it hits that exact level that you set for it so a lot of settings that we must do uh, every morning to ensure that we're filling to the, the proper level each day so what are the activities that are going on every day in the um Distillery. It looks like you, you potentially could be bottling every day. Yes, uh, it, you know, depending on the kind of season and how busy we are, um, yeah, we'll often have a, one or two distillations going on. We have um, two stills, so we are able to uh, distill both gin and whiskey at, at the same time with our with our steam boiler set up. Uh, we can be bottling at the same time, and we can also be processing um, other other spirits for other things. So we can be Cutting, like we could be cutting a batch of vodka while we're bottling gin, while we're also distilling whiskey and gin. That would be a pretty, that would be a pretty big day. Uh, but that would be something that would be possible, uh, given our setup. But most days we're, we're usually distilling either gin or something else. Uh, gin is the bulk of what we do, so you know it's more often than not. Mm -hmm. uh, but bottling, these you know, be any number of days a week. So yeah, you could have a number of things going on. Um, that. But with the whiskey, eventually you see that um, you'll have whiskey ready every day in a few years. Uh, you know, it could be. I mean, that, that would be a lot of whiskey. Um, but it could be, given, you know, oh, you're we've got a lot of one, You're making one batch of whiskey a week right now? We've been. Uh, so it, it kind of comes and it goes when we, depending on our capacity and, and uh, needs to do other thing, things, because it's it kind of scarce resources all over the place. Um, so, yes. Um, we will, and it's kind of indeterminate exactly when that will come off. Uh, our whiskey will all be straight malt whiskey, so it's 100% malted barley, and it being straight um, means that it has aged at least two years, but for our flavor profile, uh, that may take longer, so somewhere between two and, and three years probably, and at that point we'll have, you know, a, a lot more coming off, um, probably be in, you know, in the th or low thousands of cases per year pretty soon, but that just kind of depends on <clears throat> uh, kind of decisions we make mm -hmm. regarding whiskey production. Um, Looks like Tom has a question. Uh, does the gin get bottled right after distilling and diluting, or does it need to be filtered or go through some sort of aging and stainless? No, essentially uh, you could be making, gin, you could be bottling gin just a few days after you'd receive the raw ingredients and, and start the process. Uh, it does need to be diluted. Um, as the product comes off the still, it starts at a very high proof, so you're talking uh, over 80% alcohol, 160 proof, uh, and each producer kind of has a different uh, profile for what they, they shoot for, but we usually typically end ours around 120 uh, based on the blend of botanicals. It, it hits a point where it, it gets unpleasant uh, flavor-wise, and so you know we'll just disregard the rest. Uh, that'll be basically the waste product. Um, so at that point I go into, we'll collect everything that we have that day uh, into a tank, and we try and blend a number of batches together to ensure consistency since it is a batch process. Um, but essentially, as soon as you collect it in a, everything from a run in a tank, you could then uh, put it into another tank and dilute, you know, dilute it down to your bottling proof. So it's taking it from about 140 proof to 84 proof for us. And um, you know, at that point, you can bottle it as soon as you're ready and you're confident that you were uh, at your correct bottling proof with intolerances. Mm -hmm. So everything does get filtered uh, for particulates. Um, 
but the you know the need for that as opposed to uh, craft brewing is, is much much less. Uh, there's a lot less filtering, so it's it's more of a particular issue, if anything, has, has kind of gone through. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Reading neutral grain spirits prior to distilling for the gin. Uh, so the thing is, alcohol is a great solvent, and so it's we're usually using that um, at the full strength to extract. Uh, you know, flavors and aroma uh, from the botanicals that we're using. Um, so it will be diluted before it is added to the still. It's extremely difficult to, um, while you're add, adding water allows you to lengthen your cuts and so it, it provides more of a base for you to then extract and still from. So if you were to still from 190 per spirit, it would be actually really dangerous and you wouldn't get very, the separation between your kind of phases as the distillation goes along would be, they wouldn't be very good. So this allows us just to have a, a bit more safety, uh, allows us to control it a bit better and, and improve the yield in the end. So we're, we're cutting that high strength um, spirit with, uh, with all the botanicals added with water first to uh, get it down to something like 30% alcohol uh, as opposed to that 95%. Oh, so you're adding like three to one or something? Uh, yeah, at least two to one, yeah. yeah. Indeed, yeah, um, but it's it's really it's pretty it's pretty typical for um, when we're doing the whiskey. We're we're taking it in two stages as well, so it's going from about seven percent alcohol and at first distillation through a pot still. Um, you know, it's it is able to concentrate it pretty well, but it it's going to require two passes. So you'll hear a lot of people talk about beer stripping runs, and that's the first one. So you're concentrating it from that seven percent to somewhere over thirty, thirty-five percent perhaps at the end depends how far you, you take that, but most people are going for the maximum amount of alcohol, so they're taking it pretty far down. Uh, and then in that second installation, generally people will collect a number of batches, uh, clean their still, pump it back into the still, and then re to get it to a higher level. For us, that ends up being probably about uh, 140 proof, but you know, it kind of depends on your, your fermentation characteristics, uh, what you're starting with, and uh, kind of the flavor profile you're shooting for. So for us, that's usually where that ends up before we're uh, taking it to the barrel. So we'll look at a few more slides. Um, this is the whiskey. Indeed, it is. Um, I think there's not too much to say. Hopefully you <laughs> like the packaging. Uh, this is the, as you can see in the package, 100%. Uh, uh, it says uh, single malt uh, Oregon straight malt whiskey. Westward mm -hmm. is the, the label. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, yeah, it's it's this one's out already. This one is out. Uh, everything that we're talking about is uh, mm -hmm. is on the market, um, certainly in Oregon and some other markets as well. There's there's the whiskey. Exactly. Yep. Um, this. Oops. Yep. Sorry. That's all right. So that this is the, this is the whole range, and that this is the Aquavit, um, so the Scandinavian uh, style spirit. Uh, if you've ever been to Sweden or Norway, I mean, there's aquavit all over the place. So one of our founders is Norwegian, and uh, this is kind of somewhat of a family recipe, he says. Um, our kind of take and spin on that. Uh, this is a, yeah, this is a lineup of what we do the most of. Um, so what is the mix in terms of what gin is your number one performer? Sure. And then that's followed by... Uh, it's probably the kind of it kind of depends on the season, but right now it's probably probably the vodka. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of hard to say because yeah, the gin and the aquavit are our oldest products, and so uh, and we've been kind of rolling out nationally with a number of the other products too. Uh, the gin is certainly the focus, but gin is available in in many states now. Uh, just about all of them at this mm -hmm. point. Um, we pursued nationwide distribution in this last year, so mm -hmm. we've rolled out to a lot of states. Um, so yeah, we are pretty much in just about every state at this point, I think, um, how far into each market we are, but um, but definitely with the gin. And then in select markets with the Aquavit, the whiskey, and the vodka as well, mostly in some more popular, populous California, mm -hmm. New York, and things like that. So I don't know if anybody, um, <coughs> saw the New York Times article today in the dining section has a, has a couple of interesting distillers in New York and one of them is making a fig based product from dried figs which is traditional uh, Jewish 
Okay. I believe it's kind of this SED thing. It's yeah. A very interesting product. And then the other one is, the other article is about aging gin and barrels. So yep. that leads me to ask you, what do you have any plans for doing an aged? Yeah, so uh, so what what she's talking about is the old Tom gins that's that's come in, into vogue in the last several years. Uh, so barrel aged gins, and there's quite a few on the market. Um, one of the kind of pioneers of that was was Ransom down in the Willamette Valley. Um, I mean, Tad at at Ransom is he's been doing that for oh, oh probably almost ten years. Or I don't know exactly how long, but he's been doing it to the point where he's almost kind of. You know, when you see recipes, people referencing old Tom Gin, they almost always call it ransom old Tom Gin. Um, so he's done some really nice stuff there with that style. And um, yeah, so usually, usually old Tom Gins, they they were aged in a barrel, and they're often uh, sweetened at some point. So some a bit of sugar was was added to to the gin at some point, uh, sweeten it and to kind of give it a nicer, softer effect. Um, we haven't done anything with that. I would like to do something with with aviation in a, in a probably used whiskey barrel or something of some sort. Uh, I just haven't figured out the exact vehicle. Um, but it, it's kind of an interesting uh, mm -hmm. vehicle and people are kind of really interested to it. So as a small series, we have a, a line of small kind of products that we do just out of the distillery uh, in a kind of apothecary bottle style. And what are, what are some of those products? Uh, so we've done, uh, we've done some uh, rums from Barbados Molasses. We've done coffee liqueurs. We've done some uh, Uzo type spirits. Um, done a white whiskey, so an unaged whiskey. Uh, basically came out that way. So some of those have gone further afield, and some have not. So you may have seen them out in the market, like the rum, the coffee liqueur, and the white dog. Uh, you may see in bars and liquor stores across Oregon. But um, so you see a bunch of different things out across the spectrum. Uh, just anything that seems like fun. We'll have some things coming up. Too. So John's got a question about, um, in your experience as a craft brewer, did you utilize spent whiskey barrels? If so, can you give us an idea of how many times an aging barrel could be used for making whiskey versus how many times a similar barrel could be used for aging a beer? Sure. Uh, so to make a bourbon whiskey or a straight whiskey in the United States, there, the regulations are very clear about that, that it must be in new charred American oak barrels. So to age whiskey in it, uh, for the purposes that we often think of here with bourbon, uh, you can only use it once. Uh, and so you'll see what a lot of the, the producers in Kentucky do, your, your Jim Beans, your Heaven Hills, et cetera. Most of their barrels are going to, um, to Scotland, so a lot of scotch is aged in used American bourbon barrels. I mean, they, they take a ton of that. Um, of course, as we see brewers using it much more as well. So. There's, there's quite the demand. Uh, there's a huge kind of whiskey boom going on right now, so that's probably why you see a lot of uh, higher prices for used barrels. I mean, they've, they've really shot up over the last couple of years. Um, to the point that you get quotes where they're not, for used ones aren't much cheaper than new ones, which is incredible, um, unless you're buying in you know, significant volume. Um, but so you could only use it once, and at that point, um, you know, you, it's also used. <laughs> you can actually keep talking. Okay, so they can still hear. Yeah. Okay. I mean, everyone can still hear. Um, so they they often get pushed to uh, rum production or or scotch production because they're not looking for a lot of character from the barrel itself. So you can use it once to really get the the great components for your whiskeys out of it. Uh, and then for beer, similarly, uh, we really didn't do too many. Uh, we did maybe. A handful of, of barrels uh, of beer in bourbon barrels at Trogues, but my understanding was once, maybe twice. Uh, at that point, you'll have soaked up all the flavor. For for using beer in uh, for using whiskey barrels with beer, my understanding is that you're you really you're kind of absorbing a lot of the wet characteristics that are already. So uh, after that first use, um, you know you're probably not going to get much more out of it. So at that point, either you know you use it as decoration, or perhaps you could use it to uh, to age something in a sour fashion, but that's that's usually kind of less common, so maybe twice. Um, do you see Tom's question about? Uh, when in Trogues of making Kavas? No, I, I think, so I left Trogues in uh, early 2011, uh, so I I don't know that I was there for making the Kavas, but that sounded pretty interesting. I don't know if they were making it with rye bread or, or what, but um, 
that's always one of those esoteric styles you're always interested in seeing like people doing this. Do you want to tell people a little more about what that is? Uh, Kavas, it's, well, it's a kind of a historic, uh, traditional uh, beer of Russia that they made out of rye bread as the fermentable. And so you'll see, you often see uh, recipes for that and it's like making a fermentation out of, of rye bread and probably baker's yeast. It's a very low alcohol uh, beer that that would make probably 2% or perhaps less. That's my understanding. Um, so I, I believe they still drink it. Like they have trucks that drive around in, in Russia that uh, people would fill up with containers of kvass and you take it home and drink it. Um, I've never seen that, but that's, it's, always, it's always one of those kind of fun weird years of the world kind of thing that you mm -hmm. see. Um, I think it might be, it might have, I don't know if they, uh, and, and leaving that wa the wash behind, you know, you're, you're making, loudering it, essentially. When you're making rye whiskey or corn whiskeys, you're taking that whole mash and you're fermenting that, and then you're distilling it on with all the, the powder behind, so usually they're just, they're pulverizing it, uh, and to make rye or, or corn, you know, they're adding enzymes as well to either liquefy or then to aid fermentation. Uh, so we don't we don't really do any rye whiskey. We have done a batch in the past where we used a good percentage of malted rye, um, but essentially as you would with the beer. Uh, so I think it did show up a little bit, but you know the, the effect is not usually that strong. Most of the rye whiskeys that you see are about 95% rye, uh, and so that adds that that huge amount of spiciness to it, that kind of characteristic of rye whiskey, and then people think in rye beers, but um, uh, there's there's not too too much character. I don't think we're saying. Any other questions out there? Mm -hmm. Quiet night tonight. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Tom yeah. has a lot of questions. Um, Anybody else have questions? Tom has a lot of questions. <laughs> I think you can go ahead and ask your questions, Tom. Yeah, shoot away. I mean, uh, there's always one guy on the tour that has has a lot of questions. Most people don't really know too much to ask. Uh, so how do we dispose of our heads? That's just uh, straight down the drain and you know, diluted to a, a large degree. But, uh, you know, they're very unpleasant, so they're, they're nothing that you can really want to use again. Um, <clears throat> when, when we get to the tails portion of the whiskey, we, we will recycle that. Uh, into the next batch because there's a lot of good flavor and alcohol in that, but uh, the heads are often very unpleasant. Um, you want to say what percentage of the distilled product falls yeah. into those categories? Just to, yeah, I know so, there's a few people. I know Jan was on the tour and she's here, but um, mm -hmm. some other people weren't on the tour. They don't. Uh, they don't know how the how the, yeah. the distilled spirit comes off <clears> and <throat> separated into different components. That, yeah, uh, it's, well, it's hard to say because it, it changes. Um, with the gin, we don't collect the tails, so. I would say there's probably about 5% might be in the heads there, and that's because of the, the oils that we're trying to segregate from the rest of the, of the spirit that we're collecting then for, for consumption. Uh, for whiskey, um, it's probably closer to, oh, it's probably less than 5% as well. And then the, the main the bulk of what we're going to collect is probably 80% probably heads, hearts or so, and a little bit of of tails, and usually it just depends on how long we want to stay collecting uh, tails that we'll redistill re later. Uh, you can burn the heads if you like. A lot of people use them for um, things like uh, maybe charcoal lighter. They're you know, extremely high in alcohol, so they're going to burn. Um, they also make a nice sanitizer around the distillery. You know, when, I'm, when we're making beer, they're, they're great for you know, spraying uh, ports and things like that, and uh, smell great because they're, they're nice and orangey. These towers are so. Um, you know, if you ever need a handy sanitizer, we don't need we don't need to buy any sandy clean for that. So we'll often use it for that. And it's the same when we cut off the hearts, are we going by smell and taste, or cutting at a specific temperature? That's a great question. So when we're when we're doing any of the the hearts, uh, any of the cuts that we do. Um, First of all, we're looking at the temperature in the still. We have thermometers in the still that kind of guide us there. And then we also have spirit hydrometers that we're using to um, look at the, the proof coming off the still. So that gives us a good clue. And then, then we are using the smell and taste uh, factors, especially when we're making the whiskey. Um, you know, we know when we're at the, the heart stage when, it, when it's gotten nice. There's a pretty steep drop off between uh, 
uh, the unpleasant uh, heads portion of it and then the really nice parts. So it's basically you must babysit it and, and monitor uh, the distillation, especially uh, our, our stills are very hand uh, driven so it, it's all by feel that we're, we're driving steam to it and uh, so we're cutting back on the steam then because you know, we're rapidly trying to heat and then hit a level where things are coming off the still and then we, you know we really got to cut back the, the heat on it then to, to get to a nice stable uh, flow. But so yeah, a lot a lot of smell and taste to to kind of keep it consistent. So a lot, a lot of training that I do with my assistants, you know, regarding so that we do it in a consistent kind of uniform way, um, which is which is tough because everyone tastes things differently. Um, but you know, some pretty good guidance. Nice thing is that we'll, sometimes we will redistill a, a small percentage of the heads so we can collect, um, you know, in, in one gallon aliquots and then decide what we are going to toss and then what we might want to redistill and then what we'll want to, uh, to keep the product like that. So why don't you give them a sense of the time frame of, um, for example, for these guys, they're getting their wash from a brewery, and then mm -hmm. how long, what's the schedule like for the week? So, and how long yeah. does it sit in the distiller? Because that people probably don't know how long a day of distilling might take. Yeah, well, it's, it's really going to depend on the size of your still and uh, the size of the, the beer washes. I mean, we'll bring in uh, three twenty barrel batches that will distill over three days for our our beer stripping. Uh, so we bring it in on a Friday, uh, do the fermentation over the weekend. It's extremely fast. It's not temperature cooled, unlike uh, brewing. So it, you know, in forty eight to seventy two hours, you have complete uh, fermentation. Um, as he's asking there, uh, do we use a normal beer yeast? Uh, yes, we are. Uh, we like the flavor from the ale yeast. It gives us a lot of great um, fruit and uh, Nice spicy flavor. So we're using mostly typical American ale yeast that's readily available, uh, and, and our brewing partner is has a great supply of that because it's pretty pretty nice fruity to neutral character as you're going to get with most of the Chico strains. Um, turbo yeast that would not be recommended for anything that besides vodka. Uh, turbo yeast is great. It's it's really good at at fermenting really really dryly and really really quick, uh, but the flavor characteristics are usually pretty null and void. Um, so if you're, if you're making vodka and you're stripping out to try and get to a really pure uh, ethanol, uh, then you would use it. But for our whiskey, we're looking for a lot of flavor uh, to come over across with the distillation. So uh, a lot of those uh, esters, particularly from the, the ale yeast, are really nice, especially at high temperatures. We're getting a lot of those. Uh, have we played with different yeasts? Yeah, we've gotten uh, we've had different partners. Um, so they've each kind of had a house strain. Uh, we try and stay with American, sometimes some Scottish uh, yeast, which is a little... It doesn't ferment quite as dry, but the flavor characteristics are nice. But we've used, you know, inadvertently, we've used Belgian. I think we've used a German strain or two. Um, but almost all with 90, 95% of the time, I'd say it's American ale yeast. Uh, and so, yeah, we uh, for maximum fermentability, uh, yeah, we do have our, our brewing partner mash uh, pretty low because we're looking for um, we're looking for the flavor, but uh, at, by the point it's been distilled, really, uh, the yield is quite important for what we're doing there. Uh, our main brewing partner is, is a brewer in uh, uh, Milwaukee. It's called Breakside Brewing. So they have a pub up in northeast Portland, if you've been to Portland, uh, and they have a production facility down in Milwaukee. So 30-barrel uh, brew lengths, it's, it works quite nicely for our system, uh, how we've arranged it set up. Uh, he's asking how if we switch based on our their capacity. I mean, yeah, there's some people have been you know, really into it, and, and some folks just, you know, as they've grown, uh, haven't had the time to accommodate us as, long, as well as their, their own needs. So it's kind of important to have a, a brewing partner who's kind of probably at the same place of, you know, you are with growth or with uh, spare capacity. Well, Breaks, I built a very big they production did. facility. So right now, yeah. I would assume they have <coughs> excess capacity, so it's a good Indeed, especially since we're not requiring any fermentation space. Um, they're brewing the beer for us and dispensing it in the totes with the yeast for us. We're bringing it into the distillery and then performing the fermentation ourselves uh, in our own tanks. So it's it's pretty. It's got to be pretty much the nicest brewing they, that they do all week because they, you know you don't have to clean a tank or, or do anything. You just knock it out right into a set of totes um, with some yeast pitched in it as well. So. 
yeah, I would, I would have enjoyed that back when I was at Trogues, you know, just mm -hmm. hook the hose up and, and start dumping out. That would be that would be all right with me. So, um, yeah. And then when it gets into the dist the still, mm -hmm. how long of a process is that? Well, for our batches, uh, for we have a 700 gallon still, and we're, we're basically running 20 barrels into it, so you know, 600 gallons or so. <clears throat> it's it's probably about a say 10 to perhaps 12 hours on the beer stripping, and it also depends if we're running gin at the same time. Uh, our boiler is able to keep up, but uh, it takes a while to heat up that much uh, liquid if we're running both things at the same time. So um, it it can depend. So we'll often end up with some 14 hour days uh, if we're doing both, um, and then the the second pass of the distillation our our, <clears throat> our spirit run. That'll often be a 12 to 14 hour day. Just um, that goes. That ends up going slower than the beer run. You're trying to get a bit more of a, a little bit more ref reflux going on there, and uh, slower distillation for flavor characteristics and the separation that we want. Often but, be a little bit longer. But during that long time <coughs> period, um, how hmm. much of the time do you actually have to start focusing on the separation? Uh, it's, it's usually pretty. It's usually pretty short. There's. Uh, once you kind of get an idea for the time frame that things happen, I mean, you can be doing a lot of other things. Just like in a brewery, you can be multitasking with a number of things. Check if you check it every 10 minutes or so to see where the temperatures are, and then you know where your temperatures are. Um, you can start adding the cooling, start backing off the heat, and all those things. You know, take just a little bit of time, but you know, kind of adds up. So it allows you to do other things. You can be say, filtering something or cleaning something or or helping somewhere else out in the distillery. But just to have that kind of internal clock as just about any brewer would have doing a lot of those things. So there's not a lot of things that you really need to actively watch it, but um, you, you don't want to watch it the whole time, but you don't want to not watch it for you know, 20 minutes. Uh, but those things will take you know half an hour to an hour kind of at those really critical junctures. And then the rest of the time you have a lot of time to uh, for other things. Do you know the brand of the still? Uh, there's, there is not a brand of the still. We had this custom built. There's a uh, fabricator in uh, Candy Global Stainless, uh, so we work with them kind of on our own design for the stills. Uh, so they're, they're basically um, repurposed kind of brewing equipment that we've kind of modified. So it's kind of a standard design for them. So if you saw a picture of me looking into our still, that would basically be a kettle in most brewing setups, um, or or very similar design. And then uh, we have the we have a column on top, not really a column, but just like more of a narrower column to go up to our arm that goes across, and then the condenser uh, right next to it. So it's kind of a, of our own design, but a very very basic pot still, but it suits our needs really well since it brings over a lot of flavor. And it does a nice distillation for us. Um, so it's very it's very basic, but um, it only has copper at the in, in the yeah so. Um, as it is basically brewing equipment, they're you know, stainless steel. Uh, but for making whiskey, uh, copper is really important. Uh, most stills that you're going to see throughout history were made of copper. It's a great heat conductor. It's really easy to work with, uh, from a metalworking standpoint and was in the past. And uh, people don't realize it, but it was very important for the flavor of the whiskey. Um, when you're doing the fermentation with the beer yeast, as with anything, you know, it's going to kick off a lot of sulfur-containing compounds. And when you're distilling, you're going to end up uh, capturing a lot of those. A lot of those are going to be very volatile and come over. Uh, so the copper actually works as a sacrificial surface. So we add a lot of copper packing to the column of our still. Just in an effort to make all the vapor travel through it, uh, have the sulfur after that copper, and take that kind of sulfury nastiness out of the spirit. So it works really well for that. Um, so it doesn't really have to be complicated to, to make a really nice spirit. It's just kind of understanding of the, the basic chemistry. Uh, behind it and making sure that you have what you need in there to, to accomplish that. I think if you look at the, the New York Times article today on distilling, you'll see some, they show some quite nice copper stills in there. They're $100,000 each. I think they're about a That's right. 20 uh, barrel. Uh, yeah, so if you're, if you're looking for like a Holstein still or, or something really nice, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of great stills out there. Um, I mean, even a, even a small small still, you know, that can hold like 50 to 100 gallons is going to be you know, probably in a probably thirty thousand dollar range. So ours are much cheaper. It's probably a third of what she was saying for the same kind of size still. 
Uh, you know, ours is a lot more basic, and we kind of basically uh, designed it ourselves. So it's also not sort of a showy. No, no, no it's more of a it's a worker. <laughs> it is a worker. I mean, it still looks cool, and it's yeah, uh, it's a fun piece of uh, equipment to operate and kind of climb all over. But um, yeah, it is it isn't kind of the you know, the showpiece copper still yeah. with all the. Uh, portholes that people you know, you'll see. It's, yeah. If you look at the, I think in some of the slides I showed some stills at Stein's Distillery in Eastern Oregon. It's a hundred and fifty thousand dollars still. It's yeah. got all the beautiful, yeah. you know, copper and bolts and window portholes. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. probably like a thermostatic cooling, so it, it mm -hmm. kind of senses the the heat level of your condensate and then can adjust the cooling. Uh, but they put it the right in their window behind the tasting sure. room, but. If you don't you show your still, then you don't have to spend as much money. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you know, so we do we do end up doing a few, uh, few tours on the weekends. Uh, yeah, next time you're in Portland, uh, let us know. I'd be happy to show you around. But um, yeah. well, no, yeah, you know all you know all the questions at this point, so it's uh, very good. Oh, here's one from Aaron. Uh, That's a good question. What's your opinion on brew pumps that put in a small still for some limited spirit production, hmm. like Rogue, um, yeah. a novelty or a serious potential income generator? I guess it depends on how much time you want to spend doing it. Um, you know, if you're just getting a very small still in there, I mean, you have the thing to keep in mind is that you're making a very small amount of spirits um, based on that. It's got, it depends on whether it's probably more of a novelty. I mean, you could make some decent money if you're able to hold on to the spirit, you have the capital to invest in in your beer, first of all, then to distill, buy the still, buy the barrels. Uh, but probably the most the most difficult part of it is a lot of the federal regulations. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of regulations, zoning and whatnot, codes for uh, brewing, but uh, I may, may I assure you that they are only more complicated and, and more expensive from a federal standpoint for spirits uh, and everything else. I think it could be fun. I mean, I know there's a, there's a guy, I believe, in Idaho that has a craft like distillery pub group. I know there's definitely one I've not been to, but I, I've heard of, and that might be one of the few. In Drake's? Or outside said, of Drake's? Uh, I think it was in Boise. Oh, okay. Is there another distillery right outside of Drake's making potato vodka? Oh, ah, yeah. Um, I think this guy might be making whiskeys and maybe some liqueurs and things like that. Probably certainly gin. I mean, you should at that point. Um, and so I think there's, I don't know if there are issues around uh, breweries that also are, are licensed for spirit production. I know wine and spirits, usually there has to be like a wall between the two. So mm -hmm. you'd almost, my guess is, uh, depending, if it's a lot federally, then you can probably start, but you know, then I don't know what it is between for each state. Uh, but there's often has to be like literally a physical wall between the two. Um, so it's, it would be interesting, you know, I always think about that, you know, it's like, it, hey, it would be great to have just a supply of uh, beer all the time going, you know, going right next door, you know, you just pump it over and, and I'll take it from there. So I think that's how Stranahan's actually may have gotten started back in the day with Flying Dog in Denver, I want to say, because they, mm -hmm. they started with, you know, malt whiskey and, and now they're, you know, they're quite huge as far as a craft distiller goes. But you know, I think I think you would find the regulations would be probably the, the stickiest part of that, mm -hmm. uh, and then then the, the needs for capital and things like that. But it'd be fun. I mean, hey, you can make your own bourbon barrels. Yeah, mm -hmm. that'd be great. That's a question about the community of small distillers. Uh, yeah, this friendly of small brewers. I think often it is. Um, I think brewers are a little more open. I think in distilling, you'll often see things that are treated more proprietary, trade secrets, things like that. Um, yeah. um, so I, I think among dis distillers, and most of it is, you know, you're, you're mostly looking around large companies, and so there's a lot of proprietary stuff there. So um, just trying to learn about craft distilling. Uh, I came into the industry less than two years ago, just trying to learn. Um, there's there's much less literature about distilling than there is than there is brewing. Yeah, the gin recipes as a closely held thing. I mean, there's there's something to that. I mean, it's you know I think if you gave me enough cracks at it, I could probably replicate a lot of gins out there pretty close. You know, and everybody talks about the the spices that they use. I mean, that's kind of like you know brewers talking about their hops. Um, so you, you 
you had an idea, you could probably you could probably get pretty close if you gave yourself enough attempts at it. You know, I don't know, ten or twenty if you really wanted to. If you really wanted to make Hendrix, I, I think you could probably approximate at least close enough. Um, but you know, most people would have different telling. Um, and there, there's a lot of the craft brewers that have since gotten into distilling, so I think you're seeing a lot of that. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of the same kind of same kind of folks. I just met a number of guys from McMenamin, and they were, they had used to be brewers. So uh, the founder of our company he used to he used to brew as well. So at McMenamin's, so um, kind of it's kind of a natural progression. You know, you make beer and then you can go into whiskey. Uh, do we have any plans to make a Scotch whiskey? Uh, probably unlikely. Um, you know, it, when you get into peating, I mean, it's it, it would it would certainly be something that we'd be capable of doing. Um, when you call it that, you'd have to call it something. You would have to call it so, I, Scotch style. Yeah, I'm trying to think about what um, Steve McCarthy at Clear Creek he makes a Scotch style whiskey. Um, so you, you could do it. I mean, I, I think the demands for how long it would need to be aged are kind of end up being prohibitive for a lot of small makers. So, you know, if you're talking about aging something 8, 10, 12, 16, however many years, <laughs> it's like, whoa. Uh, it's amazing distilleries have been in business as long as they have. But um, it, would be, it would be a fun project that I would yeah, I'd enjoy doing it, but uh, they probably won't let me. But. It's better to go on a Scotland field trip. Indeed. I, but, I mean, there's there's some small distilleries. There's a group in Tennessee called Corsair. And they're doing a lot of stuff with different smoked uh, malts. So we kind of have, we're focusing on more uh, one expression, which is our westward. Uh, and they have, you know, just a whole variety of different things. But, um, yeah, it would be fun. But so You're a member of the guild, right? The Distilleries Guild? Yeah. So I don't know if you knew that um, Tom, who had asked about the community, they have a the distillers have a guild too. Mm -hmm. Like the um, yep. brewers, we have the Oregon Brewers Guild. It's called mm -hmm. the Oregon Distillers Guild. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, so yeah, just like that, and it's one of the first uh, guilds of its type in the country for distillers. Um, brewing guilds there, they are they're everywhere these days. But distilleries, it's you know so much more of a nascent. A business that there's not too many craft distillery guilds. So we're one of the first, so uh, kind of a feather in Oregon's hat there. Uh, what will they let me do for a fun project? Oh, oh. putting whiskey in barrels is, is pretty much fun anyway, and having everything, I'm uh, managing a lot of the process. So having things just run smoothly is a, this is a pretty fun pro project for me. And we do do some small batch stuff, so we want to kind of ex express some kind of creative stuff. But uh, uh, with the growth of the business and just all the different things that we're attacking for projects um, that's usually fun enough honestly I want everything to run smoothly so that's what I want to do it's a boring answer but the further you get into it the more that sort of thing is appealing but rest assured we do, we do do some small stuff we have a very small batch of uh, age doc will be coming off uh, very soon so that's kind of a fun project that we've been playing with and maybe in a morrow or two so Exciting things. <laughs> mm. Any other distillery questions? You got a chance to type? Well, it was a quiet night tonight. I guess we, were, we started early and that probably was tough for people. So sorry about that. But uh, thanks for participating, everybody. And thank, we're happy to have you monopolize the time, Tom, because you ask good questions. Indeed. And thanks, Aaron, too. And I, I hope the rest of you enjoyed this, and, and thank you very much, Andrew, for coming in and joining us. Sure. Very much appreciated. And I, a lot of the students, uh, the whole rest of the class is going to be watching this as, as the taped version. I know. So we appreciate that. Hello to you in the future. Jan is also a, a uh, distillery enthusiast. Oh, right on. <laughs> she, she's in Washington, though, so oh, slightly different battles. Right, Jan? You're in Washington? I think I had it right. Yeah, so she has struggles with uh, challenging laws, which you're going to now get out and change, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's, uh, Lobby to change those difficult laws. Yeah, well, it's uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there's, it's a very good environment for it in Oregon, I would say, overall, uh, in terms of working with the various kind of governmental agencies, particularly the OLCC. They're very receptive, and uh, it's probably a pretty good model for 
in states that want small craft distilleries, you know, the way that the OLCC kind of accommodates and helps the smaller producers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, probably we couldn't do it in states that weren't control states that allowed us to have effective statewide distribution for uh, essentially all of our products. So it's uh, they're really cool. They um, almost funny to say that about the regulating agency, but they uh, they've, they've done some really good things. So um, yeah, got Washington being more like Oregon. Yes. Uh, all right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. We're going to sign off since uh, the conversation's dwindling. Mm -hmm. But thank you, Andrew. Sure.